for you, O Lord, my soul in stillness waits. Truly my hope is in you. The theme we're offering for this Advent retreat is waiting on God. Advent, indeed, is a season of waiting. Among other things, it's a season of healing, of forgiveness, of reconciliation. It's a season of renewal. Advent encompasses all of these realities. Waiting on God. It could be said that Advent is the consecration of our waiting, a consecration of our waiting in our lives. Human life is full of waiting. We wait for buses, we wait for planes, we wait for trains. We stand in line. We wait nervously in the dentist's waiting room. We await news from the doctor. We wait for the phone to ring with a call that brings eagerly awaited news. We wait for the slow process of healing to take its time. We wait for the birth of a child. Waiting can be very different in these different situations according to our attitude. In an age of instant everything, waiting or delay can be perceived as purely negative. I want everything and I want it now. Yet some things can't be skimped, some things cannot be hurried. We have to let them take the time they need. And when it comes to our spiritual lives, faith can demand long, patient waiting when nothing seems to be happening. And this is just as necessary for spiritual growth. We sometimes just have to go on doing the small, ordinary things while we wait on God. This is exactly what Mary did. She waited for the birth of Jesus. Like her, we have to wait for his moment and wait for his work to ripen in ourselves. His moment, his work. I want to turn to Mary as an Advent personality. The image for this second week of our retreat comes from the Dominican painter Fra Angelico. He lived in the convent of San Marco in Florence, Italy in the 1400s. His image of the Annunciation introduces us to Mary as she receives the Word of God. The Annunciation introduces us to the reality that God is about to enter into our world, enter into our story, our life, and she will be the one to give birth to the Messiah. It seems to me that Mary can school us in the act of waiting. I want to begin with this image and then look at four ways that Mary profoundly models waiting. Here in the Annunciation, Mary embodies her people, Israel, as they awaited the Messiah for centuries. Mary is a kind of corporate personality, summing up in herself the hopes and dreams of her people. The Jews were promised a savior, a redeemer, and through their history, the prophets foreshadowed his coming. Here, Mary is daughter Zion. She is the symbol of all the centuries of waiting. She is virgin. And she waits as a virgin does, simply, chastely, with eager anticipation. I think the virginal waiting of daughter Zion is the posture we see in this fresco. Mary sits on a simple stool, no fanfare, no trumpet blasts. The scene is very austere and I think very intimate. Mary and the angel Gabriel 
incline towards each other as if exchanging confidences. There's a kind of stillness in this scene. And so this is the first kind of waiting, messianic waiting, daughter Zion, the people of Israel awaiting a savior. Mary's posture of virginal waiting is receptivity and openness, a ready stance, virginal waiting. Mary makes room. She makes space for God. Here at the Annunciation is a virginal hospitality. Let me read from Luke chapter 1, the Annunciation scene. Luke 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And with that, the angel departed from her. Virginal waiting. The second mode of waiting is what I'll call maternal waiting. Mary is pregnant with the word. And like all mothers, she waits nine months in order to give birth. This is a different kind of waiting. Maternal waiting is active. It's dynamic. There's growth every day. There's a blossoming. Mary, as expectant mother, models a longing, a desire for the child within. Maternal waiting is also a kind of hospitality as she awaits the new amidst slow growth and change. Joyful expectation. But this maternal waiting also includes anxiety, worry, impatience, discomfort. And Mary also makes room for that. Waiting quite often is unpleasant. It's challenging, it's demanding, it makes you crazy. Mary's pregnancy was not easy. Her maternal waiting can also challenge us in our spiritual lives as a pattern of faithfulness and hope amidst the hard work of waiting on God. And it is hard work. The third image of waiting in Mary's story is waiting for Easter after the crucifixion. Mary stood at the foot of her son's cross, as the Gospel of John tells us. She was there. How do you survive something like that? How do you go on 
after he's been brutally killed and buried. Now what? What do you do now at the darkest hour? The tradition of the church tells us that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his mother first. Makes sense, right? Of course it does. But what about the in-between time? Waiting in hope in the darkest hours. Waiting from Good Friday to Easter, perhaps the most difficult period of waiting. But some of us go through this terrible kind of waiting too. And here Mary is a model of hope. She waits in hope, even though by all outward appearances it seems futile, it seems empty, waiting on God. Because there's simply nothing else to do. Waiting on his time not being in control. Whew. I hate that part. But Mary also embodies this kind of profound waiting. Mary is Our Lady of Holy Saturday. She keeps the flame of faith alive in those darkest hours while Jesus is in the tomb and the apostles have vanished. She waits for justice, she waits for peace, she waits for the kingdom in its fullness. She waits when all seems lost. Holy Saturday, a dark day. But Mary, as the embodiment of the church, as the archetype of the Christian community, as mother of God, waits in hope. So this third type of waiting is the waiting of Our Lady of Holy Saturday. And maybe you've experienced this kind of waiting in your own life. And if you have it, you will. So, so far there are three ways of waiting modeled by Mary. First at the Annunciation, which I've called Daughter Zion, Virginal Waiting. The second, Mary is pregnant with the Word, maternal waiting, waiting for the birth of Jesus. And this third is waiting as Our Lady of Holy Saturday, waiting for new life, waiting for new birth from Good Friday to Easter. The fourth and final model of waiting I want to mention is waiting for the church to be born. The book of Acts tells us that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with the apostles as they prayed and waited for the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Another Fra Angelico. Waiting for the birth of the church. In Acts chapter 1, Luke tells us this. Acts 1 verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. All these devoted themselves with one accord to prayer, together with some women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So in Acts 1, Mary is there in the midst of the apostles who, by the way, didn't exactly act bravely or courageously during the Passion. They all fled, and Peter even denies three times that he even knows Jesus. What was that like when they saw Mary for the first time after Good Friday? How did she react to them? The scriptures don't tell us, but she is a Jewish mother. <laughs> they look pretty serene here. <laughs> They're obeying Jesus in the upper room by waiting, because Jesus says, wait here in the city. So this is an act of obedience to Jesus. They're waiting in the city of Jerusalem for the power from on high to come upon them. And they wait nine days. 
the original novena. Nine days after the ascension of Jesus back to heaven, they received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Remember at the Annunciation, the Holy Spirit came down upon Mary. Gabriel said, you will be overshadowed by the Spirit and conceive in your womb and bear a son. So what Mary had received earlier in being overshadowed by the Spirit now comes to the apostles. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and the church is born. Mary is waiting, as Fra Angelico paints her, as spiritual mother of the church in their midst. Jesus is the word become flesh. And St. Francis of Assisi said, Mary is the virgin become church. The virgin become church. She's an archetype of the church. She's a symbol of the community of believers. Mary is the church in miniature as she gathers the apostles in the upper room. This fourth way of waiting for me sounds a lot like the kind of waiting we're doing in this time of church crisis. Are we waiting, gathered in prayer, looking for a new Pentecost? Maybe we're waiting for a healing. We're waiting for a solution. We're waiting for a new order. And Mary is our spiritual mother during this time of crisis in the church. Mary, as a space of spiritual hospitality, can make room even for this crisis. She can take it in. She can bring it in. It seems to me then that waiting on the Lord has a Marian texture to it. I think Mary models for us waiting in very challenging and profound ways. There's a Marian style of waiting, I think, which is a spirituality which comes right from the scriptures themselves. Waiting on God is good for us. It opens us up on the inside. Maybe in the end, it can be more fruitful if we decide to live with the lingering question, if we decide to live with the unresolved situation, if we decide to slowly grow towards wisdom. Maybe this is better. Maybe this is better than finding a quick and easy solution or a quick and easy answer, which is dictated by our own desires rather than revealed in God's good time. As Mary shows us, waiting changes us. Waiting schools us. Waiting teaches us to know God and his will. For you, O Lord, my soul in stillness waits. Truly my hope is in you. Thank you. So as we did last week, um, we want to have two prompts or questions or at least conversation starters with the two or three people around you. The first one is, which image of the four of Marian waiting speaks to you now, today? And then, here's an easy one. Why is waiting on God so hard? It's 12, just about 12.40. 10 minutes, let's have 10 minutes and then we'll come back. So 10 minutes. Two prompts, 10 minutes.